We welcome in the Lord of the Kings beat and 1320 Kings insider, our man James Ham. Hammer, how are you feeling, buddy? What's going on, guys? How are you? I'm good, James. How you doing, man? A little chilly out there? You got the hoodie on? A little chilly out there? Uh, It's not super chilly, actually. I was just I, I just made a run to the Target, and uh, you know I thought it might be chillier than it was, but like 64 degrees up here, it's nice. It's but nice. you got to rock the merch, too, and that's the rare oh. King's Beat merch that's oh, got right. the James yeah. Ham name on it. That's like the Ooh. that's like the collectible right there. Not everybody can get the one that got the James Ham name yeah, on it. Yeah, man. It's a special one. It's a special one. Yes. We, we were, I'm sure you caught some of that conversation we were having about the, the, the Warriors right now. And we've, we've talked to, we were talking to Kyle Madsen earlier and we've been trying to figure out like, what are the Warriors? Like they've, you know, they, they still have guys kind of in, in, in solid positions, solid veterans and, you know, Steph and Clay and Draymond and Kenny and I are a little bit different on this. And I think that team is still capable of winning an NBA finals, but yet you still have this tremendous trove of, talented young guys and the dynamic of playing all of them and developing them. Like, of course, we're always looking to poach someone talented, but it doesn't look like any of those guys are getting out of there any soon, particularly Jordan Poole, who, you know, Kyle thought, yeah, Joe Lacob will ac absolutely spend money uh, to keep Jordan Poole around here. And do you think that the Warriors are still in a, in a, in a title spot? Yeah. I mean, why not? I mean, I, I think this is pretty wide open. I think the Eastern Conference is much better than the West. Um, but saying that, you know, the top two or three teams in the West are still really good. And, you know, if, if you're looking, if you think, if you're an Eastern Conference team and you think that the the Suns or the Warriors or even the Nuggets with Jokic or Utah or John Morant are going to be a cakewalk, I think you're in for, you know, sort of a, a rude awakening. Uh, but when it comes to the Western Conference, I think it's so wide open. And, you know, I, your first couple of rounds are going to be pretty simple if you're the Warriors. And um, I, I like their blend, what they've been able to do here, because I think we all thought that they were just going to dump these young players, e even the Weissman pick. And then you come back and you have two top 15 picks next year. I think most people just believe that they were going to dump those and, and go get veterans that could help them win now. But the Clay Thompson injury kind of opened a door for this team to take a two-year hiatus after playing so many games for five years straight. They were all worn out. And now we're, we're going to get to see, can they piece it back together? Can they be the team that they were before? And uh, I, I think people should be excited to see it because this is a veteran team. They know how to win. They've been there before. And, you know, they, I wouldn't count Steph out at any time. He's so good. Yeah. I mean, I personally don't think that they – I wouldn't pick them to win a championship. There's about four or five other teams that I would pick before them this year. But make no bones about it. What you said is 100% correct, Ham, and what you've mentioned, Damian, is correct. It is wide open. And while I think other teams have a better chance than the Warriors to win a championship this year, it's not this huge chance. Like, if I, if I think the Suns have a 25% uh, chance of winning the finals – or is it probably right behind them with like a 20% chance or something? So there, there is a, a level of competitive, competitiveness throughout the league, not just that conference, that lends, it to, lends itself to say, hey, you get the right matchup, Steph gets on a hot streak, Clay gets, for a week or two, you may be able to ride that thing longer than, than other people like myself might think. Yeah, and I also, you know, some of their veterans that they brought in, I like them. I like Otto Porter as a you know, 18 to 24 minute a game guy while you're trying to bridge the gap with Moses Moody. Um, you know, I really like Kaminga, but having Andre Iguodala on the roster or having an Amanya Bialica, again, these are moves that help you extend out and, and just wait a little bit longer before you have to put those guys in and you mm -hmm. have to rely on them for big minutes. And it's, it's a lot different. I mean, I think Dante DiVincenzo is feeling it right now. It's a lot different when you look around and you're playing with, again, like a Giannis, a Chris Middleton, a, a Robin Lopez, and uh, or, oh, Brooke Lopez, and, uh, and Drew Holiday. It's a lot different playing with that than it is playing with a group of players like the Kings have. So, again, if you're a guy like Kaminga, you come in, you know exactly what you have to do because it's Steph, Clay, Draymond, and uh and Wiggins I mean those are like very very good play all you have to do is play your role don't do any more don't do any less just play your role 
And I think that's a good thing when it comes to Wiseman coming back. Um, you know, Moody has had some really nice games. They've got a good mixture of young and old, which I didn't think they would because I thought their old would get old quicker um, and their young wouldn't be ready quick enough. But at this point, I, I think we're seeing a nice convergence between the two. Do you have a favorite player to watch? Um, it, that's funny because I know I have – like players I don't ever want to watch. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, who's that? James. Well, I, I mean, I've said that before. Yeah, it's James Harden, and it's oh, okay. and yeah. and, yeah, and okay. to be honest, I mean, a little bit of Russ. Like I, I just okay. Like, All players. right, Harden's fine. I know, Harden's I know. Um, <laughs> you know, I, like after watching Jokic this, the last couple of games, oh. uh, you know, because they've played him so many times. Man, is he just so fun to watch what he does with like a YMCA body? You're just out there like, <laughs> it's just, and you know, I was looking today, like he leads the league in defensive, uh, like uh, defensive box plus minus something like that. He leads the league in like defensive wind shares. Like hmm. how, how no I one goes I don't even know such. what that is. What's well, a defensive wind share? Well, you have offensive win and defensive win shares and, and he leads the league in win shares overall. But in offensive, uh, he's really high in offensive win shares. But in defensive win shares, he's leading the league. Like, he is so incredibly impactful on both ends of the floor. And I was kind of surprised because I was watching Fox. He kept like, should I go? Should I go? And then he's like, no, I'm not going to go inside against him. Mm. And to me, that was just kind of strange. It, it was like... I didn't expect him to be like the numbers, the advanced statistic to say that he was as good as he is. And maybe it's because some of the players around him are like defensive only guys, but overall, I, uh, you know, yeah, he's, he's a joy to watch. He's, I, I would say he's probably, not very graceful. No. Well, unless he's doing <laughs> a spin move on, unless Danny he's and passing, Jones. that was a nasty. Oh yeah. No that was at the end of the shot clock. That oh wasn't man. Fair. I mean, those things, I also love um, when players get a, like they're at the rim, but they don't feel like they, they have to just rip it down. They start doing crafty things. I've always enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, you know, watching, you know, Vlade Divac for years, watching uh, Arvidas Sabonis, I just appreciate passing big men. I just think it makes the game so much more like palatable to watch. And so, yeah. I don't know, those are two of my tops. I mean, Jaws got to be up there, though, man. Yeah. Watching the, some of the things that guy does, you're just like, I don't know, I don't know if you're going to hold up, but that was fun. That was fun to watch for that moment. So you you, you see all these teams all the time, uh, every night, every time they come to the Go to One Center, and you know, and in the past, and probably in the future too, you'll be going on the road and, and checking these guys out. Damian was talking about Giannis coming to town um, next week, and he was like. He, this is the one time I really feel like I've heard Damien say, yo, if you can go see him, you need to see him. It's different. Is there anybody, obviously probably Giannis, but is there anybody that you see up close and personal that is different than watching them on TV? Yeah, okay. So the crazy thing about Giannis is like it takes him two steps to get from like the three-point line under the basket. Like I don't even he doesn't even need two steps to like he needs one big step and a and a leap to to go from the three point line to dunking. Mm. Like even from half court, it might be three steps to the rim for him. Like just the it's his momentum, but also his incredible length. Um, that's crazy. But I, I know this might not be popular here uh, in Sacramento. I would watch Steph Curry play forever. He has such a joy to him all the way through pregame. Like there are things that he does that are, you know, everyone always sees him shoot the shot from like the tunnel, right? So we're yeah. talking like a 60 footer from behind the backboard that no one else in the league could hit. And he, sometimes he takes two, sometimes he takes three times. Every once in a while he gets it on the first time. Um, the usher that's standing there pitches him the ball every time. He makes everyone so involved. And then he starts running around. There are points where he either does like he acts like he's playing volleyball and he'll set a ball back and, court, uh, and forth across the court while other people are shooting but way up high up and over 
Um, he'll act like he's a quarterback dropping back and he'll like do a fake handoff and then, and then throw a bomb to somebody. He Mm. truly enjoys being there and he's so soft spoken and cool, uh, to be around. Um, and I know this because I, I typically for the last six years, I, well, the last, not the last two years because the Warriors weren't any good, but the years before that I would get shifted straight from Kings and covering Warriors all the way through the playoffs. I mean, I was in Toronto, um, Portland. Like, I've been all over covering the Warriors in the playoffs. Um, Watching Steph is, it always reminds me of, um, if you guys ever watch Sonic Skate, they interview an artist, like a poet guy, who's part of, like, their, their panel of people that they talk with. And he talked about watching Ray Allen shoot the basketball. And he said when... You can go somewhere on a Tuesday night and watch something that you're watching someone who is better at one thing in life than anyone else in the world. Mm-hmm. Then it it's special to watch. It's something that you you don't get to do very often. It's if you're able to sit down and watch the best piano player or, you know, whatever it is. You could go to Key Arena and watch Ray Allen on whatever night. And at that point, he was the greatest shooter in the world, and I don't even think there, it was really that close. Steph has taken that, and he's like quadrupled it. What he can do as a shooter is it, he has revolutionized the game by himself. And you can say Steve Kerr, or you can say you know, that this was part of someone else's idea that the Warriors just took and ran with. It doesn't matter. It took one player who could do something special, and he has revolutionized the game in a way, it, and I don't think the game can go back. Like it's, he's changed it so much. And yeah. you know, like we talked about yeah. Peja. Peja was like number three all time in three point shot makes when he retired, and now he's like number twenty two in a span of like eleven years because of one guy. Yeah. Uh, we talked NBA basketball. We're going to talk Kings basketball. It's our thirteen twenty Kings insider, James Ham. We'll do that when we return here. On Sacramento's number one sports station, ESPN 1320. We're clear. I need to go check on the dogs real quick, guys. I'll be back in 30 seconds. Sorry if I went long there. No, no, we're good. We're right on time. MEAC basketball. Can you name any teams in the MEAC? No. Norfolk State. Okay. This is Morgan State right now. I think Coppin State is in this. Uh, oh, Coppin State. Room. Okay. Coppin State has been a tournament team many, many times. Yeah. I don't know. They're, teams. Coppin State is always a, a 16 or a play-in or something like that. They have, this is, uh, yeah, Coppin State is, uh, they're, they're kind of, I remember them being in there a lot. Is that where like Appalachian State is and stuff like that? Or you no? know, I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is. I don't think it is. <laughs> It might be like a bunch of HBCUs, but some of them might be thought of as HBCUs and they're not actually HBCUs. I don't know. Like like Morgan. Brent, Brendan with the, the Kings make me meak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's good stuff. Yeah, the MIAC. Um, someone is asking him, is that a golf course or driving range off Lakeshore North in Summer and Summer Ridge? Um, we have a golf course and a full driving range and a putting green here inside the lake. It yeah. is an 18 hole golf course. It's not super long, but it's crazy, crazy tight from what I've heard. Um, but I have had back problems for a long time. And even though I've lived here in the lake for over a decade now, I have not played the course. Um, Are you a then, golfer? Yeah, I loved golf. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh yeah, Fair back enough. injuries. Back injuries. So. Let's see what Damien knows. Damien. Can you name two teams out of the MIAC conference? <laughs> I'll, get, I'll give you a hint. They they I think these might be some HBCUs. Okay. Oh, you think they might be HB. Uh, yeah, exactly sure. Yeah, I don't know. No. Morgan no. State is one. Okay. Norfolk Roddy. State. I don't know. Mm. I don't know, Roddy, if I can call you in the gate. I don't know about that. 
Coppin State. Does that ring? I saw uh, Coppin State. All right. Coppin State does. It, uh, <laughs> like, I, I've watched them play in the tournament. Like, I don't know how many times they've made it, but it's more than once. I, like, I see Brickhouse like, putting that work in today, though. Oh, yeah. Shoot, even Brickhouse knows how to use TikTok. Oh. <laughs> Just realize that this is a TikTok video. Even Brickhouse knows how to use it. My dumbass can't figure it out. Dropping wow. you know, in the Oh, my bad. I forgot you could still hear me. Dropping ham bars in the lab. That's hilarious. I'm going to have to watch that. Oh, yeah. Those look like Sonic's colors. I can't I can't tell what that is right it's, there. It's just the uh, the oh. piece of mold. Yeah, the plastic that... The stencil. Stencil. There, oh, there's the word. I thought it was creative trolling. <laughs> That's awesome. This is such uh, great stuff. Such great stuff. Uh, oh, my gosh. Who is that? One year agreement with Adelton Simmons. Oh, Cubs. Man, people are are signing everywhere, everywhere. I see Kershaw got his one year. That's no surprise. He wasn't gonna leave. He yes, only got he one year. Yeah. yeah, but he's Kershaw's kind of done. Yeah. Yeah, but I would have made them pay for it. Yeah, I didn't see what the. Uh, I didn't see what the deal was. I mean, it's got to be thirty. That's a lot of money. I don't know if it's 30. Not for Kershaw. He can't even play a full year anymore. Kershaw. I should probably put Jeff Passon on alerts. Yeah. I don't, he's, I don't, I do not have him on alerts. Well, the he's big been pretty one good. For is Chris Bryant and um, Freddie Freeman and Carlos Correa. Mm. Not me. I'm an A's fan, so I'm <laughs> waiting to see my entire team get traded for a bag of. <laughs> Like oh, I feel nuts. bad for you guys. You're all saying the same thing. That's so sad. It's not even like a good bag of chips. It's a bag of corn nuts. And you're like, oh, oh man. we corn got nuts. corn nuts for him. We got some pig skins for him. Corn nuts are bomb, man. We got some sunflower seeds for that guy, but not, not the good sunflower seeds. Like the like the ones with a really bad flavor. Yeah. Ranch. The... Yeah, the the original Pringles, you you get like the original flavor, which is actually not a flavor. You know, that's what <laughs> that's what they're gonna get. Like, <laughs> I'm just waiting for it. You know? yeah, that's my new favorite thing: the original flavor. It's not a flavor. It's not a flavor. We're coming yeah. back. My name is D Nice, although I hate to admit it. It's this is Friday edition of D-Lo and KC brought to you by McQueen and the Violet Fog, the smoothest gin in the world, handcrafted in Brazil. First pour, 42 minutes. Uh, the countdown is on. No Kings game tonight, so we're just hanging out, talking, uh, talking basketball with our 1320 Kings insider and creator of the Kings beat. Uh, James Ham, do you have this? Is a this might be a trickier question. I asked you about favorite basketball players to, to, to watch. Do you have a favorite king that you like to watch? Like historically, or uh, no? Because that's too easy. Like, well, I mean, not 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 that not that your answer is easy. But like, is there a favorite? Like, is there a player on this roster that you you really enjoy watching? Actually, you know what? When Rashawn Holmes was right, and he yeah, had me too. Like a, a true lob threat. I, I absolutely, I loved in uh, watching him like go out and defend the perimeter. He's just so good. Just like stays down. Um, yeah. I, I just really, you know, like he's underutilized now and, you know, and actually ha just hasn't been playing, but not utilized. Yeah. yeah I, I like what I, I love watching Sabonis because, mm -hmm. you know, for so many years we've watched players in Sacramento that don't know how to uh, like inflict pain <laughs> and Sabonis knows how to inflict pain. Yeah. And, you know, like Boogie was at the game the other night. I, I went over, uh, said hi to Boogie. Um, he teased me about my goatee. Um, <laughs> I teased him about the white hair and his. Um, we're both getting old. Uh, I broke into the league with DeMarcus Cousins um, in 2010. That was my first year covering the team. And he was my first one-on-one -on -one interview, which was crazy. Um, but the cool thing about watching him is each and every night he did something that 
uh, a six foot ten player, six foot eleven, whatever you want to call him, had never done before. Mm-hmm. Um, like the way that he can contort his upper body, like in a crowd, um, the way that he could handle the the ball. You know, even Chris Chris Gent told me one time because I asked him about the comparison between Elijah Wan and and Cousins, mm-hmm. and Chris Gent mm-hmm. had played with Elijah Wan with the Rockets, and he said. Hakeem could put the ball on the floor for maybe two dribbles. Hmm. He's like, this guy, he's out here leading the break and going between his legs and spin moves at half court while a guard's trying to steal the ball from him. He's like, this, this dude's just different. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he did s- stuff that was amazing. Rudy Gay, like there's a thing about Rudy. Like when Rudy Gay wanted to be great, he he looked like George Gervin, like so smooth, so silky smooth. So I enjoy watching beautiful basketball. And, and one of the nicest guys probably in league history. Rudy Gay? Yeah. 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 Well, that and he's also, he's Switzerland. Like, everyone likes him. He's the dude in the middle <laughs> that, like, like yeah. anyone and everyone can be his friend. And he doesn't care if, you know, one side of the locker room doesn't like the other side of the locker room. He doesn't care. He, he likes, like, he's okay with everyone. He, he mm-hmm. was a good dude. Yeah. yeah. And even, like, his, uh, Kobe's last game in Sacramento, um, Rudy had his little boy Clinton with him and uh, brought him over and Kobe took pictures with him and kissed Clinton on the head. Like I have pictures of it. Um, yeah, that that's Rudy's a good dude. Really, yeah. really good dude. You know, this may be uh, against the rules to say right now for some people, I don't think for most people or for some people, but when he's on, like when he's in his bag last Saturday, for example, man, De'Aaron is fun to watch the way he can handle the rock. The way he maneuvers around guys and through traffic and finishes at the rim, it's 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 a joy to watch. I'm not gonna put it on Kyrie level because Kyrie is probably like the top for me watching him go when he's going. But man, De'Aaron when when he's in his bag, so to speak, I think that's a lot of fun to watch as well. Yeah, I I love watching De'Aaron play. Um, I, I like better shooters typically. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. you, like you brought up Kyrie, and I, there are times where um, where De'Aaron looks like Kyrie with the speed button down. You know, like mm-hmm. when he starts really flowing, there are moments where De'Aaron starts to float, and you're just like, "Oh, he's in he's in a mode." <laughs> and when he does that, I, he's as good as any player in the league. And I, you know, there are moments where he he shows flashes of absolute superstardom and you're just like those are the nights that you're you know you're excited about it's not just you know like the 44 point game he was really good in that game but he just rammed it down everyone's throat like he he really was so aggressive in that game Uh, but there are other times where you know he just he's out there uh floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee i mean it's just like some really pretty stuff to watch and so yeah I, i mean i do enjoy watching um, him play, I do. Yeah. I, and and yeah. uh, and all of that is accurate. But you know what? Like all the you know everything you said about Steph and the joy that he plays with. Like even in De'Aaron's finest moments, I I can never look at him and go, man, De'Aaron's having a lot of fun today. It's like oh, he's just out there playing basketball. It doesn't like, show any emotion. Like sometimes, sometimes De'Aaron, sometimes De'Aaron looks like someone who is really good at their job. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's okay. and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Like you could be a basketball player, a professional athlete, and look at it as a job. And I'm not saying De'Aaron does. I'm just saying sometimes he looks like someone who's really good at their job, and he just doesn't have that that joy. You know, as you were talking about Steph Curry a minute ago, like he doesn't ha- or he doesn't show it that same way. It's really hard to show joy when you win. That's a good. That's that's games. a fair point. <laughs> that's no, a good point. <laughs> and, and I think you know the other problem is is if you show joy. When you're, you know, a thirty-something win team, then you get roasted for it. Like he, he gets it maybe more than everybody else that you're not allowed to go over and act all chummy when you just got your, you know, behind kicked by by thirty points. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like like Buddy Hield or Tristan Thompson. Like there, Fox understands that, and so maybe he doesn't show some of it. But there are moments where I can remember him like celebrating, and I kind of, you know. I miss like it, the NBA is so crazy because you watch players grow up in the league. So I, like if you, some people don't get that. They just watch it every year and like, okay, he's getting better. He's getting better. He's getting better. He's 19 years old and all of a sudden he's 24. 
he's this young brash kid who's talking about sliding into dms and now he's a guy with a fiance who sits courtside every every night you know Mm -hmm. he used to be the dragon ball z spiky hair kid now he's you know he's got some really nice waves uh and we talk about it all the time uh like we still have our competition after games about what do rag he's gonna wear uh, what color do rag he's going to come out with. We have a competition because we're waiting for an hour and something for him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's a way for us to like, kind of like lighten the mood and have a good time with it. Because if not, it's just like, okay, this, this is really getting old. Um, but yeah, I, I kind of miss the young De'Aaron cause he was different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't miss young DeMarcus. I like DeMarcus <laughs> now a lot more than I like young demarcus it was it's crazy hearing you like demarcus having gray in his beard like damn it's been that long that is 12 damn. years that is 12 damn. years in the league yeah, yeah. Oh. it's funny you bring up demarcus because i did want to ask you about something you, you talked about how you know you met up with him and we saw different pictures he was meeting up with everybody it includes his former <laughs> boss and that struck me like i i wasn't expecting to see that i wasn't prepared to see that i thought it was a cool moment for him both Vivek and DeMarcus to, you know, have a hug, have a little chat and things of that nature is the whole thought, I guess, for me, I, I don't want to speak for anybody else, was that like DeMarcus was like not happy. Like and he's the type of guy, Petty LaBelle, you do him wrong, you cross him, he's going to remember that forever. And we thought that was the situation with Vivek not giving him the, the, the deal, trading him, things of that nature. Was it ever really that deep or was it more so DeMarcus has kind of grown up and can see things a little bit differently now, or is it a little combination of both? Well, I think in this situation, it's who you blamed for what happened. So Mm -hmm. I don't think DeMarcus blames uh, Vivek for what happened. I think he blames Vlade. I still Mm -hmm. think that he would hug Vlade because, I mean, he understood at the end of the day that it was a business decision. Um, But, uh, you know, like, look, Michael Malone. He might now. Speak? He wouldn't have. How long ago was that trade? Five years ago? He wouldn't have hugged him four years ago. Yeah, maybe not. I, I don't know. I, I, because I've seen those two around each other um, after the trade. Um, but, I mean, did you see Michael Malone go over and hug Vivek? <laughs> no. No. That's, no. that's never, never going to happen. No. Like, I, I mean, I would be worried that, like, if I'm Vivek, that you walk over and there'd be something in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that Michael Malone left you, security. Left you something in your security seat. Security Mike's coming like, home. Security. <laughs> hey, did, like, who did this to my seat? It's like, uh, we don't know. Like, the Denver Nuggets coaches were over there. Like, uh, Michael has always held a grudge and has always, he hits us with zingers almost every single time. Like, he, like, the fact that he got his 300th win in an, as a Nuggets head coach in Sacramento. Like, I mean, that guy, I guarantee you if there's a good chance he tied one on after that, he was very excited about that. And, um, yeah, so there was no picture of Vivek and Michael Malone. I guarantee that. All right. No picture. So, no. I mean, can DeMarcus get the one day where he comes back? And I feel like this fan base still adores him. Half of it adores him. The other half half doesn't. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> he's the most polarizing dude that's ever been here. And there's no question. Yeah, yeah, for like, sure. Like, I mean, around the for league, sure. like, for some reason, Isaiah Thomas is polarizing. In Sacramento, he was spectacular. Like, mm-hmm. not only on the court, but as a personality. I mean, that guy showed up to city council meetings when they are trying to move the Kings to his hometown of Seattle. Uh, so it, that's just different, you know. So I have never got, like, around the league the the weirdness that is Isaiah Thomas he's like brash he speaks his mind uh, but he's also super low-key you know not mm-hmm. like like cousins like he can wear out a group for sure so <laughs> james ham 1320 kings insider hanging out here with us on this friday it's the kings and the jazz tomorrow we were talking about how you know Donovan and De'Aaron used to be names that you would kind of compare against each other and i think it's interesting now that the Jazz have been built around their guard and Donovan Mitchell and their center and Rudy Gobert. And here we are in Sacramento hoping we've taken the first steps to build around our guard and De'Aaron Fox and our center, Devonta Sabonis. And we kind of went through that Jazz roster like, man, if he could just get the right pieces to kind of 
fill things out around those two. There's really no, I don't know, who is the third man on the Utah Jazz? Like, I don't know who that third dynamic player is, but they got a lot of really good ones that know their role, particularly Mike Conley with all the talk about leadership and all of that stuff. That's certainly something that Mike Conley brings. But as I looked at the Jazz roster, I thought, you know, (laughs) Quinn Schneider being a very, very important piece in all of this, that's a team that you can look at and go, if you if if you find the guys who do the right things to put around them, man, you could put yourself in a good spot. I totally agree. I mean, that that's one of the like if you're gonna start modeling yourself after teams, I, I think it's Denver and it's Utah. Um, you know, Sabonis is not like the the funnel, the shot block. I mean, he's a shop uh Sabonis isn't the shot blocker that Gobert is. Um, and he's not a guy you can funnel the entire defense down to for sure. But at the same time, like Sabonis is so much better offensively than Gobert will ever be. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, it's not even remotely close. Gobert is just a straight pick and roll guy. Um, on occasion, he'll hit a shot and you'll be like, huh, I didn't see that coming. Um, but, uh, yeah, those are the teams. Like, how do you build a team, your team around a speedster, uh, like a high volume scorer and uh, like a center of the universe big. And I, I think you look at both of those teams, what they have is high IQ basketball players that can shoot the three. That's that's like the key to everything in the NBA, high basketball IQ players and the ability to shoot. And mm-hmm. the Kings need to find so many more of those. Um, but like, again, Utah has so many guys that you can just rely on that – you know, no one is a star, but they're a star in their role. So again, like Bojan Bogdanovic, uh, you know, my, uh, even who's their, uh, the other guard that they shoot, that they start sometimes. Um, um, Joe, all he does is, Joe well, no, Ingles, right. Ingles is gone. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, who's their, uh, their defensive minded guy. That they start? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah those guys like that they just plug and play guys that Mm -hmm. come in they do their jobs so well like you don't have to be a star in the league the biggest Mm -hmm. problem with a team like the kings and when you keep bringing in first round picks like all of those first round picks are still waiting for the moment where they get to be superstar and it just doesn't happen for most of them and so if they don't settle in and figure out that the the nba is filled with for every superstar there's 30 30 guys who are our role players. And mm-hmm. if you don't try to be the best role player and what you can do, then you're not going to find success in the league and you're going to be out of the league. And that's how guys stick. That's how guys work their way into the league from the outside because they figure out, you know, two or three things that they can do really good. And then they, they fit into those roles and they do their damage. And so uh, that's what the Kings need to do. They need to find a bunch of guys like Royce O'Neal. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. And, and when I talk about the Kings being a player away or even two players away, ideally, yeah, you want another Sabonis like stud, but it doesn't always necessarily have to be that, right? It could be a Royce O'Neill, or it could be, I talked about earlier, if they found out a, a way to go get Joe Harris, you know, from, from Brooklyn this offseason. Somebody that we're just, and, and even with Justin Holiday, because I'm about to bring him up, now you got him where maybe he doesn't have so much on his shoulders as far as we need you to be this three-point shooter that you're going to take 10 threes in this game, nine threes in this game, and you need to hit four of them. That's, yeah, he's not making shots, but also he's being miscast right now in this particular situation, in my opinion. So you get a guy like Joe Harris in here and where Justin Holiday was going three of 13, maybe Joe Harris might be able to go six of 11. And that's... That changes everything. That changes your point total because you got those three extra three pointers. That changes the way the defense defends the bonus. The defense defends Fox. Maybe opens up some more for them and everything else like that. So when you talk about the Kings being, you know, a player to away from being where Minnesota is, ideally, yeah, you want a superstar, but it might not have to be a superstar. Just guys that fit better with what they're trying to build right now. Yeah. I mean, like adding superstars is is so incredibly difficult for the Kings. And, you know, for the most part, they aren't a, it just doesn't happen. You can't find superstars who are willing to come to Sacramento. I mean, Chris Weber is clearly the biggest name player to get traded to the Kings, um, Mitch Richmond, but like, where do we, 
that's pretty much where we end, right? Mm. So, so like finding superstar guys that can change everything is really hard. And and I think what you said there about like you could add a piece to this team and get up to like the Minnesota level. I agree with that. But that piece, I don't even think has to be that great. It has to be a really solid role player. Um, and that's where I think like if you can get a big name piece, if you can or if you can get, you know, if you can go out and get a John Collins, like you open the door for you to not just be, uh, you know, a, a team that could get up to like the seven, eight, nine level. Uh, but you could you could take a much bigger step. And I think that's where McNair is really focused is on going out and getting like another tremendous game changer, but one that fits with the guys that you have. And I don't know if that will work. I mean, like you hope that it will, but I'll also say that like at this point, I think they have two pillars for what they're building. You know, you have Fox and you have Sabonis and you know that those guys are really, really good with potential to be like as a pairing, like, like superb. Mm -hmm. And now can you get the pieces of fit and, I mean, it's, that's going to be the most difficult thing. And can you get pieces that fit, that know that they fit and know what they're coming here to do? And that's always the problem. You know, like, again, not to, don't, this is, don't take this wrong way with Buddy, but like, Buddy still thinks he can be Kobe Bryant. Like, that's, like, you're, you're 29 years old. You've been in the league for six years. You can't keep having delusions of grandeur. Mm. And that's where, you know, you even have to be slightly concerned that, you know, you hear that, uh, you know, a guy like um, Dante DiVincenzo was, he was kind of looking to get out of Milwaukee because he wanted a bigger role. He wanted to be able to expand and show people more of what he can do. And you know, we heard the same thing about Miles Turner. He wants out. He wants to be a number one option. And it's like, okay, look, at, at a certain point in the league, you need to be who you are and you need to be really good at it or you're just going to keep bouncing around. And so... Oh. Like, yeah, the Kings need to find players that will fit with these guys and do it really quick. Is that biggest, is the biggest name out there this offseason, you think, for the Kings, John Collins? I mean, maybe. I mean, I mean we never know how these things, sure. uh, you know, shape up because they, they tend to change really quickly. I mean, like, who ever would have thought that this whole Ben Simmons thing would happen? Who thought that James Harden could be traded again midseason? <laughs> Like you thought that that team was going to be together for the next three or four years, like trying to string together a bunch of championships as far as Brooklyn. Um, but like the, the league changes so quickly and you need to change with it. And, but you also, you have to just, you have to be right. And so like, again, we're watching Denver and I was such a proponent of going out and getting Aaron Gordon for years. Like go get Aaron Gordon. Like, mm -hmm. because he reminded me of like Andre Karolinko. I watched him play on Denver, and I'm like, oh, geez. whatever you do, don't go get Aaron Gordon. Like, that, that's not good enough. That's not, like, the player that you need. And the guy who is still out there shooting, like, four or five threes a game when he can't hit a three, and everything looks on, uh, off balance. And, you know, there there's just so much to it. Like, you, you have to make the right move here. Or you got to keep doing these little short-term deals with guys that – can at least give you an idea of what you're building for, you know, the guys like Alex Lynn or the guys like Mo Harkless who, you know, are in on four or four and a half million dollar contracts. They fill a specific role. They do what they're supposed to do. Um, but they also are, you know, good teammates and, and good locker room people. Um, they're just not people who are going to change the fate of your season. Right. Yeah. I, I just, I, I look at what this team could do this off season and James, we talked about this yesterday. Now Monty's going to have to go in here a little bit blind this off season. And we talked about somebody like Terrence Davis, and, and how Terrence Davis might be the answer at shooting guard. But I almost feel like Monty has to approach this off season because unfortunately we weren't able to see Terrence Davis with Sabonis and all this other stuff. Almost got to go in there assuming that Terrence Davis isn't the guy. And yeah. you need to improve at the shooting guard position a in a major way. And, yeah, Terrence is coming back, but he's not that guy. He'll be a bench guy. And you go out, you be aggressive to try and fill that type of spot or fill the four spot. And then when they come back, if Terrence really does fit well, well, I'll take that problem. 
you know, of having two guys that fit really well at that position and could start as opposed to doing like Damian said he did with Luke Walton, where he was like, ah, well, we think Luke Walton might be the guy, but we're not sure, but let's bring him back and find out. You can't bring back Terrence and find out. You need to know what you have going into the season, and that's why this offseason you got to be aggressive to, to fill the holes. Actually, I, I think it plays into a bigger conversation and a bigger question about what's happening right now. So, like, uh, today on, on the Kings Beat, uh, Brendan Nunez wrote for uh, for the Kings Beat today the first time I've had someone else write, uh, which was a breath of fresh air for me. But it was on, like, hey, look, you got to start Dante DiVincenzo. You got 14 games mm. left. Like, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Like, you need to know who Dante – everybody in the gym – knows who Justin Holiday is. We knew who he was like four games into his tenure with the Kings. That's that ship is sailed. We understand who he is. Like he there you're gonna need him to finish out this season. So I don't think you have to do like the Jeremy Lamb, Mo Harkless thing where they're just sitting out and they may not play again. Um but at some point you would think that they would go, okay, can this be our pairing? Can this be our backcourt for the future? Because if not, I think you're right. Like, how do you walk into this summer thinking that, you know, you might have to sign DiVincenzo for a contract between like 10 and $12 million a year. So I take that with the 6.3 owed to, um, to Holiday, and all of a sudden I'm at 16.3, and all of a sudden I add Terrence Davis's $4 million, I'm at 20.3. I'm at $20.3 million, basically I'm paying Buddy Heald's salary but I got three guys and none of them can shoot like Buddy Hill and none of them can do some of the things that I need. And well, do they have their own skill set that makes sense? Sure they do. Um, but do not one of them separates himself from the others. So what I need, I need Dante DiVincenzo to start it, start and play 30 minutes a game at the two and show me that he can separate himself. Like, can you separate yourself? Can you be the guy that we're going to pay the summer and put next to De'Aaron Fox and open up next season because now Terrence Davis makes perfect sense. Terrence Davis as Vinny Johnson as as the microwave makes perfect sense. Jamal Crawford, uh, you know, like there there's a role there for him. Mm -hmm. um, if not, I can't go into next season hoping to be a playoff team with like a true competition at the shooting guard position between Justin Holiday, Dante DiVincenzo, and Terrence Davis. If I've done mm -hmm. that then you you already lost. I mean, in my opinion, you know, and and I'll even say this: I like if you're gonna do something like that, then I need someone who's different. You know, go mm -hmm. get me, go get me Malik Monk. Go have De'Aaron Fox do some, you know, some recruitment here on his starting backcourt mate in Kentucky. At least, boy, you just made Kenny's Friday. Goodness well, gracious! I've been saying it since since the draft. They should have drafted yeah. number ten. <laughs> yeah, but like when you're looking at him, you're like, okay, well, at least I understand that you're going to come in and, and shoot eight threes a game. That's it. Like whether you're starting or you're coming off the bench, I know exactly what I'm getting from you. You're going to shoot, shoot, shoot. And uh, and that's what I think makes this like there is a pathway here. You can see it. What you can't do is you can't trip and take the wrong path. Hmm. You know, again, you can go out and get Malik Monk and you can try to trade Justin Holiday in some package somewhere else to do something, and then you can gamble with the other guys and see how the, that five-guard set works with Davion and with De'Aaron. But, man, you gotta you got to hit this one right, and you, you cannot make a mistake. Um, I mean, you can make, like, small-level mistakes. So, like, again, if you're paying Malik Monk uh, two years at the, the, mini, the biannual exception, like uh, $5 million a year, um, that's fine. You know, that's that's not a big extension like where you're you're like going out multiple seasons. But, man, you got it. You got to do it right. And, you know, someone brought up like shade on uh, shade on sharp. Um, like there's like going and getting a young player who doesn't understand. Is, that's not what we're talking about. I, mm -hmm. I'll almost guarantee you this. If the Kings are outside of the top three, there is a very good chance that they are trading that pick. Mm -hmm. Very good chance because they do not want to wait around for somebody to. Uh, you know, wait around three or four years. Now, if somehow you land in the top three and you're looking at Jabari Smith Jr. and or you're looking at Chet Holmgren and you're like, okay, I'm willing to wait, you know, give this kid two or three years to work with Sabonis because I think they can be great. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But uh, yeah, is that you, the cutoff? 
You think cut off cut off is the top three? Yeah, because even like I I think the top three, and that's because you're hoping that someone else takes uh, Paolo Banchero above, uh, you know, above one of the other two. That would be the reason why I'd say three, and I don't think it's much higher than that. Like there are some good players up there for sure, and there are some good players at like eight, nine, ten. Um, you know, we can we can break into those guys here in the coming weeks as we we start doing draft prep stuff, yeah. uh, but you know, like Jabari Smith and, and Chet Holmgren to me, like they fit because they're stretch fours who can block shots and who project as that at the NBA level, you know, rebounders, mm-hmm. multifaceted players, uh, high ceiling players, Holmgren, you know, a stiff wind that you got to make sure the the big glass windows are closed at golden <laughs> one. Cause he could get, you know, blown out into the Delta at some point, but uh, you know, at seven, one, one ninety five, like there's, he's skinny. Uh, but mm-hmm. he gets you three blocks a game. You know, there's there's a lot of things that I think they can do in this year's draft. And but, you know, being the number six pick right now, this is like losing games, showing fight, being competitive, like going toe to toe, having the crowd be fully engaged, getting a, like a really fun, entertaining night out where you're watching the MVP go up against a team that's even lacking Sabonis, and you lose by a couple of points. That is the best of all possible worlds. What do you Except think? on the twenty fourth, you oh, win on the twenty fourth. Yeah, you win that one. You win that you, one. You go you, in the you win that field one. field house or whatever yeah. they're calling it now, and you you do work. Yeah, you you don't put us all through that. So you go <laughs> you go win on the twenty fourth. Is it the twenty fourth or twenty third? Oh, maybe it's the twenty. Th- I, I, I don't know. Twenty fourth is you know the off the I record do. with the Kings beat. That's Park. right. That's Ooh. what I'm focused on: the uh, infectious disease control. Infectious disease control. <laughs> Yeah, yes, and someone I'm else sorry, brought up. You're Ke- right. It's the 23rd. Someone else brought up Keegan Murray, and uh, like I, I really like Keegan Murray. People should watch Keegan Murray. Um, but I'm gonna throw mm-hmm. out a player comp that uh, he keeps reminding me of. And the problem with this player comp is you gotta prove that you have a motor. So he reminded me so much of watching Marvin Williams, and Marvin oh was wait well, he was the number two pick in the draft. He lasted in the league for 15 years. But he lasted in the league because his talent was so tantalizing that even like like 12 years in, you're like, I can't believe I just saw him do that. And then like he never did it again. You're like, what, what happened? So that's the one concern I have with Keegan Murray, that, that he is one of those guys that looks so good but maybe doesn't know how to do it every night or doesn't know how in a bad game to call for a shot or uh, you know how to stand out. Um, but again, I, I really like I like his game, and I think he he would look good in a Kings uniform if you somehow end up at eight or nine, and and he's sitting there. What do you think of? Uh, we've been mentioned in the chat a little bit. I, you know, I've, I've liked this guy a lot. Um, throwing a throwing a bag at at uh, Lonnie Walker to be the starting two. What do you think about him? Mm, I don't know. You know, like if. If Greg Popovich is willing to let someone like that go, um, then I'm kind of like of the opinion that like where's his ceiling? Mm. And he's erratic. I, I think he has moments where he's really good, but other moments where you're like, okay, like, you know, does he look great against the Kings? Sure, but you know, so did Jason Smith every time he played the Kings. You know, so did Derek Smith. That's why the Kings gave up half their roster to trade for Derek Smith. You know, like the Kings have a way of making randos look great. And so I I don't want to like judge Lonnie Walker without watching like 20 different Spurs games against better teams than the Sacramento Kings. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, at the same time, like we we fall in love with other teams players when they play the Kings because, you know, the Kings have the worst defense or the second worst defense in the league. And it's it's really not a good thing to to base your beliefs of a player off of what you saw in their, their stints against Sacramento. I, uh, I, I've owned this James. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Um, but I'll repeat it because again, I owned it. I think the Kings win tomorrow. I just look at the, I, I don't know why other than I look at the schedule ahead. I look at the way that they're playing. I look at this matchup. I look at bonus coming off of that suspension. I look at the way De'Aaron's playing it's going to be tough for them to get games over the course of the next couple of weeks. I think they can get Utah. 
That's all I have for that. I think they can do it. Uh, that's a really it's, tough place to play because, it, you know, you forget it's at elevation. Mm-hmm. Um, it is, it is at like a really high, like, and their, their fans are always noisy and crazy. Um, it's a, it's a good spot to go watch a game actually. Uh, yeah. I mean, they've played we Utah got Dante tough. now. Da- Dante will level <laughs> off that Utah crowd. We're all right. Ah, there you go. We got, we, that's why this is the perfect time to start Dante DiVincenzo <laughs> is this game in Utah. This is the perfect oh God, time we're ready. to do hey, it. Hey, what? Oh, look at the shooting guard. Okay. Dante. <laughs> yeah. I want to see I want to see him play huge minutes. Yes. I do. Like it's so sh- weird that Alvin has played with the rotation so many times in the starting but he just won't budge on Justin Holiday. You know, and then Holiday had like the like his defense has stepped up here and there. Um there are defensive lineups where he looks incredible like the back-to-back blocks he had against Denver that I mean it was mm-hmm. like oh look at that um I, I think we're starting to see him settle in a little bit uh but man I, I just I, I gotta look at something different I do like, yeah. there's there's no reason there's yep. there's absolutely no reason not to try stuff and for that matter like I, I think that he should have split when we got to like 16 he should have split it like eight games apiece between Davion and Dante like I want to see them both I want to see how they both fit in there. And, you know, uh, DiVincenzo was really interesting to talk to earlier in the week. He he really was so focused on, you know, just how hard it's been to find his rhythm while trying to fight for a rotational spot. So he lost his job basically because he got hurt. And then trying to get his rhythm back, he didn't get to go back in. Again, it, just because you played with the Bucks before doesn't mean that it's the same Bucks team. And when you're playing on the bench versus playing with, you know, again, Giannis and Middleton and, and Holiday, it's just totally different. Yep. Yeah. I'm with, I'm with you, Bart. I'm going to ride with you on this one, man. Yeah. Kings away. Yeah. Well, now I'm being accused of getting <laughs> going Kenny Caraway on everybody. Allison says I'm going <laughs> Kenny on him. So Allison, it's like, oh, no. I didn't no. guarantee anything. Matter oh, of fact, man. I think Damien's bill was more definitive in this Jazz pick than I was in the Knicks pick. Yeah, I, I, I don't predict I, I I I don't I don't predict wins and losses and all of this for this team. I just I I try to sometimes I feel better about games than I do others. I don't as brutal as the schedule is, I really don't think the team's gonna lose every game. Of course, the last time I said that, I was in fact wrong. They did lose every game, but I I, 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 I they get it tomorrow. Yeah. You heard it, that was my chest. Yeah. They get the Kings King, we got Drake Bars. Coming on Monday, Ham, it's happening. Did, did you hear that, James? Did you hear what my man just said? If you didn't hear it, this is what he said. Oh, Acknowledge me. Seven freaking times we've pressed that button today. Seven uh, times. What would it take for us to get ham bars? Oh. Like, would oh, would man. what would it take? To, to to get a duet with with with, with like set the scenario so we can write it down and be prepared. <sighs> I don't know. Playoff you appearance. Oh man. I like to sing too. God. I just don't say I mean I'll You could sing the hook then. Yeah. You could yeah. you could write the hook and sing it. Yeah. Uh, no. let me let me think on that. I don't think you're gonna get that, but uh we could do it on a happy hour. Like oh. And record oh. it and air okay. it the next day. Oh no. no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you said the happy hour then you changed it because it's the off the record. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll record yeah. that one part uh and get you just just after an old fashioned or two and 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 get you rolling. That's all. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll see about that. We'll see about that. All right. Well, all we right. uh we appreciate you all so much for being with us. Uh make sure you check out uh, thekingsbeat.com. Brendan's article is posted over there. They post multiple podcasts per week, and he's got uh, the incredible merchandise as well. It's thekingsbeat.com. Go check that out. If you're on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook, make sure you hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons before you go. If you missed any part of the show, uh, big thanks to Kyle Matson, Tristan Crick, in addition uh, to James Ham for being here with us today. You can check out the